Penguin Art, I'm the Video Penguin, and welcome back to Kerbal Space Program Beyond Kerbal. Not live this time, that was more of a one-off thing while we were building our interstellar ship, but more on that later. Right now, we are sending our little motley crew of Kerbals back up from the surface of Eltos, back up in the Mustang SSTO to Morningstar, waiting in orbit above them. They've explored a few different biomes, got a bit of science, and now it's time for them to go home, finally, because, yeah, they have been out in space at this point for about 17 years. I mean, they've been chronically frozen for a lot of that. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, they've uh, they've been out here for a while. I think it's long overdue that we actually send them home. So as you can see there, we've got Morningstar just orbiting overhead, and we're going to blast up into orbit to meet them. Now, uh, <laughs> I forgot that the wheels on this can't quite steer, so we plunge into the ocean here. And I was about to actually revert a quick save until I realized the gravity is so low that, yeah, we can take off so straight out of the ocean here on Eltos. It really is a very, very friendly planet to SSTOs, and so we can head up into the sky without too many worries. We can also, of course, leave the PAX rover on the surface, which significantly lightens us. It's 15 tons lighter, in fact, which means that we're actually... Yeah, we're going so fast in atmosphere that we end up exceeding orbital velocity. Now, I was just <laughs> following my standard SSTO profile, trying to gain as much velocity in atmosphere as you can, you know, before switching over to the closed cycle mode. Pretty standard stuff. Then I had a little look in the bottom left and thought, wait a second. Uh... Oh, <laughs> yeah, uh, we end up actually having to extend our air brakes to bleed off a little bit of our velocity to bring our apparatus back down to a, uh, a little more <laughs> sane number. So, yeah, we have more than enough Delta V on the Mustang to get up into orbit. So much so that, yeah, as you can see, we actually overburnt. Eltos really is a really rather lovely planet when it comes to using an SSTO because it has quite a thick atmosphere and very low gravity, which makes flying very very easy which is something I greatly appreciate so now we're just up into uh, space we're gonna just circularize our orbit and get ourselves an encounter with morning star and then yes we can finally send them home morning star doesn't actually have enough supplies to last until the transfer window so what we're just gonna do is transfer our crew on and then we're pretty much immediately going to freeze everybody because it's about uh, a year and a half until our transfer window back home. Turns out that Kerbal Alarm Clock is just a liar. Uh, it kept telling me that my transfer windows are at times when they just weren't so I had to actually figure out the transfer window entirely myself so that took a little while um, but after a little bit of trial and error I managed to figure out yeah we need to wait about a year and a half. But what we're going to do here is just drain all of the fuel out of the Mustang and then of course all our scientific experiments and all our crew members, transfer them across and then we're just going to leave it. Uh, we're starting to run a little bit low on propellant, not to the point where we need to worry, but uh, I just want to be a little erring on the side of caution here and we're just going to cut the Mustang loose. It's not really going to be all that useful other than dead weight from now on. It would have been cool, I guess, to return the crew uh, back down to the surface of Solitude in the Mustang, but, uh, ah, well, it doesn't really matter. We've got plenty of single stage to orbit vehicles now that actually use fusion power that can go up and collect them without even using a drop of fuel, so we don't really have to worry about it too much. That large central tank there as well is also completely drained of fuel at this point, so we can significantly shrink the size of Morningstar. I think it actually looks really cool now that we've shrunk it down. It's a lot more compact. Uh, uh, it really changes, it just completely changes the look of the spacecraft, which I find quite interesting. And what we're going to do here is we're actually going to deorbit this fuel tank. Now, although the Mustang might have some future use, I mean, we're never actually going to come back here. But, you know, we might as well leave a fully functional spacecraft in orbit. But this is just an empty fuel tank, so we might as well smash it into the surface, not only to keep space junk down, but also because we have got a number of probes across the surface of Eltos, which we landed in our memory mission, if memory serves correctly, no pun intended, which actually have seismic scanners so we can actually use that impact data and transmit it back to solitude as scientific data a little bit of extra science just to just to wet the whistle you know uh, and there we go we just transmit all the data that we get from that rather <laughs> rather massive impact explosion so now what we're going to do is just transmit all the science that our science labs have generated and then we're going to get everybody into the cryonic freezing chamber for the long slumber they're going to have to sleep for about four and a half years so it's about a year and a half or so until the transfer window, and then it's about three years for them to get all the way back. Yeah, uh, as I said, they have been out 
in space now for 17 years. So probably longing to get home at this point. Though they've only really been conscious um, for a couple of years of that. And actually it's only really the science crew that have been conscious for a few years using the supplies. Most of the other crew uh, have only been unfrozen when it actually <laughs> comes to landing on the various moons and uh, of course planet that we have actually visited. But there we go. They've all gone into cryo and they're going to remain that way for the next few years. So we fast forward about a year and a half until our transfer window home. You see there, Kerbal Alarm Clock is, is just lying to us. Um, I think maybe it's a little bit unreliable when it comes to planet packs. Uh, it hasn't been properly tuned, or maybe I'm just reading it completely wrong. I have no idea. But anyway, we figured it out ourselves, and we blast off out of Eltos orbit, and we're heading back home. So yeah, as I said, it's going to take about three years, and we've got about two and a half years' time uh, until a maneuver node, which will correct our inclination and get us heading back straight back to solitude and back to their waiting families that may now uh, well their children may actually be older than them which is uh, hmm. <laughs> maybe not ideal so we're going to swap back to Tycho because we're not just going to fast forward th through those three years we've got a lot of stuff to be getting on with of course we designed the Clark and all of its various different craft um, in the previous episode which was, was of course a live episode we now have three years to build an interstellar capable spacecraft and all of its assorted colony modules so yeah Tycho station it needs to uh, uh, basically take the, the kitty gloves off right this is uh this is gonna be a pretty massive project now Tycho of course previously built constellation that's what we were just all deorbiting there all of the empty fuel tanks and things that uh used to contain all the building materials and fuel for the constellation spacecraft so now we've deorbited that to try and reduce the part count of Tycho, we're swapping over to Artemis. And after getting a lot of colony rewards, we have quite a few colony rewards sort of stockpiled after the years that we've been fast forwarding through. Uh, we're now actually going to build a new module because Artemis, Artemis is going to play a very, very big role in the construction and especially the fueling of our interstellar spacecraft. So... We have to build a new module because our interstellar spacecraft, of course, is going to be fusion powered. It's going to be powered by helium-3 and deuterium compressed into fusion pellets to power our mighty Daedalus engine. But helium-3 is one of the rarest isotopes in the universe. Uh, so, yeah, we can't just buy it in because if we just launched all the fuel for the clock into orbit from solitude, it would bankrupt our space agency about... 10,000 times over uh, so we're gonna have to manufacture the fuel ourselves thankfully the solar wind over billions and billions of years has actually deposited a fair amount of helium-3 on the surface of nemesis now this is actually quite realistic in the moon uh, in reality um, the moon actually has large deposits of helium-3 which we can sift the regolith uh, to actually extract so we've got a new module there which is going to sift the regolith of nemesis and then it's going to extract helium-3 and deuterium from that, freeze that, well, freeze it down into liquids, and then combine the liquid deuterium and the liquid helium-3 into fusion pellets, which we can then ship over to Tycho to fuel up the clock. But before we do that, of course, uh, we're actually going to have to build the damn thing. And it's going to take a long time to actually produce enough fuel. It, it will actually take about three years to produce enough fuel for this thing. Um, yeah, that just gives you an idea of just why Helium-3 is as expensive and rare uh, as it is. So now we've got our sort of refinery operating, we're going to start actually shipping material kits and specialized parts all the way over to Tycho. I had a few people suggest this to me and, and originally I just sort of waved it off but then I thought a little bit about it and actually this is probably the cheapest, well by far the cheapest because it costs us nothing, uh, <laughs> but also one of the easiest ways to actually do this. So what we're going to do is build a brand new spacecraft which I have titled the Merlin and we're going to use this to transport material kits and specialized parts enough to build our spacecraft. We're also taking the four engineers that we had on Artemis to build things and we're taking them to Tycho as well. Now the Merlin is actually powered by a Z-Pinch fusion engine or Zeta-Pinch fusion engine. Uh, the reason why we have to use a liquid fuel and oxidizer propulsion system just to get off the ground is because yeah it produces a deadly amount of neutron radiation so if we use that near the base yeah we would 
very violently kill everyone inside of it. So we need to have a separate propulsion system just to take off, and then we can ignite the Zed Pinch once we're at a minimum safe distance from Artemis. Now the way that this uh, fusion engine actually works, it uses an electrical current in the fusion plasma to generate a magnetic field and compress the plasma. Hence the name pinch, because it actually pinches the plasma. And then we use the energy from that fusion reaction to accelerate a propellant through a magnetic nozzle. Now, we're not using the most efficient propellant for this. The most efficient propellant would probably be something like lithium. Uh, we're only using liquid fuel um, just because Artemis has loads of it. And this thing already has a specific impulse of something like 20,000 seconds. Uh, so <laughs> we really need to worry about it too much. Now, with the amount of material kits and specialized parts this thing can actually carry, uh, it's going to take 50 15 trips to transport enough of them to actually build our mission. That's all right though, um, because as I said, we have three years, so we have plenty of time. As well as actually transporting these four engineers from Artemis, we're also going to be launching a few more engineers uh, a little later in the episode, because yeah, we're going to need a lot of them to build this thing. It's going to take quite some time. Um, so what we're going to do is build it in orbit all in one go, including all of the modules and everything. Uh, I'll probably walk you through more of how the mission's actually going to work if you haven't watched the live stream which was the previous episode, which if you haven't, I do not blame you. It's four hours long. Uh, it was just a building stream. Uh, so if you missed it, you don't really have to worry too much about it. Everything I explained in that uh, building stream, I will explain in future, but uh, it's a little bit difficult to explain how it's all really going to work uh, <laughs> when I don't have the actual ship sitting there in front of me. But uh, the basic lowdown is we're going to build it all in one go. It's going to blast off to Valentine with 60 crew members. Yeah, you heard me right, 60 crew members. And then we've got one central command module which produces uh, enough power, has the reactor and all the necessary things to keep a few Kerbals alive. And we're going to use that and then some building materials that we're sending down with them to build an industrial module on the surface of the new world that we discover. And then once we've got the, that industrial module going, we're going to land all of our various mining modules all across the surface to get all the necessary resources we need and then we can actually manufacture the rest of the colony. About 90% of the colony is going to be constructed from materials that we actually get uh, on the new planet because we just can't actually afford to take uh, enough materials with us because uh, it's just simply going to weigh too much and also crash my computer. I mean the Clark and all its associated stuff uh, about 900 parts so even editing it in the vehicle assembly building um takes a takes a long time <laughs> let's just say that so i am dreading launching this thing i might actually get a ram upgrade because i've currently got 16 gigs of ram i may well upgrade to 32 gigs before i build this thing um who knows maybe i'll do another stream to actually pay for that <laughs> who knows super chat super chat donations are greatly appreciated when it comes to funding upgrades for my computer anyway as you see there we have arrived at Tycho station we can use the fusion engine with a reckless abandon around it at the moment because it currently has nobody on board but from now on we're going to have to uh, be a little bit Bit more careful we're just going to deorbit this little fission nuclear tug uh, this thing's been in orbit for a really long time we used to use it to go collect stranded kerbonauts in low solitude orbit and bring them to Thea station to actually stay there until we pick them up but uh, of course we deorbited that at the end of the previous series but uh, we left it around because we thought it might be useful but it's just a bit of space junk now so this is actually the first part of our interstellar mission. This is one of the craft we are going to use in uh, our actual mission. This is the IEV James Corey. Now IEV stands for Interstellar Expeditionary Vessel and all of the vessels that we're actually using in this mission are going to have that prefix. And of course James Corey it is named after after the pen name of the authors of the Expanse series. Of course a series I'm a massive fan of. All of the different modules um, and craft in this mission are being named after great science fiction authors, mainly my favorite sort of authors, which of course, you know, the main spacecraft is being called the IEV Arthur C. Clarke, or just the Clarke for short, which I've been referring to it as throughout this episode. Uh, we're also going to have the uh, actual base itself be called Weir, 
after of course Andy Weir who wrote The Martian and Artemis uh, and then we actually have a cargo variant of this Condor this is essentially the Condor Mark II you see it's a scaled up um, and refined version uh, <laughs> of the Condor we used uh, in previous episodes uh, the cargo variant of it which can carry something like 90 tons into orbit without actually, you know, needing to ever be refueled because it can just refuel itself using those fuel scoops on the side from an atmosphere, which is pretty awesome. That's going to be called the IEV Asimov. Anyway, the Corey has arrived here at Tycho Station with 12 engineers on board, led by, of course, Ben Kerman, who previously was uh, the chief engineer on Artemis. Uh, he was actually on the Constellation mission. Uh, but he got back uh, about a year ago now, so he's been reacclimatizing to Solitude's gravity, uh, and now he's ready to go back up into space. So we've got a total of 12 engineers here. Did I say I launched 12 engineers on the Condor? I meant I launched 8. Uh, so we have 12 engineers here, so we can actually get cracking on building the Clark. And you see there, we finally get building. Apparently, uh, we can build the entire thing in 36 days. Um, yeah, the <laughs> Ben Kerman's cracking the whip. I mean, you could say that Artemis has really been doing most of the work. They've been assembling all of the parts that we actually need for this thing for the past 14 years. Uh, yeah, the crew of the current crew of Artemis had actually been on Artemis in a self-sufficient base without any holiday for 14 years. Um, I guess they just like living on the moon. I don't know. <laughs> but with the colonization module, their hab timers never go down. So uh, so apparently they were perfectly happy. You can see there the actual automatic shutoff of the Z-Pinch engine actually engaging because we got a little bit too close to Tycho. So we have to turn the engine off and then reactivate it again uh, to continue our burn off towards Nemesis to return to Artemis to get our next shipment. It's going to take another 14 shipments of material kits and specialized parts to actually have enough to build this thing. So yeah, it's going to take a little while but we'll fast forward through a lot of that time of course Kerman Kerman one of the most amusing names uh, in our space crew program uh, acting as the pilot of the Merlin I didn't actually explain why I called it the Merlin um, the main reason is because it's powered by fusion magic <laughs> but also because it's actually helping to assemble a spacecraft called Arthur or named after someone who was called Arthur and I thought ah oh, what's a magical assistant to someone called Arthur ah oh, yes let's call it Merlin so I thought that was a fun little sort of name for it but yeah the crew of Artemis have been sort of assembling all the pieces of the Clark over the past decade and a half and now really the crew of Tycho is just assembling it although still 36 days to assemble a spacecraft as massive as the Clark is a little bit on the optimistic side perhaps but uh, may maybe this universe runs on Elon time who knows so we're returning to Artemis now you can see we're just ascending it's something quite convenient with the location of Artemis that we can pretty much always fly straight there because uh, no matter what sort of orbit we get into um, what sort of intercept we get we always manage to get an inclination where after a small little maneuver we can actually just head straight on down to Artemis without having to go into orbit which is uh, particularly useful it's a sort of little quirk of the inclination of Nemesis which just means that we can always head straight down to our base uh, and also just the location of Artemis as well it's almost like I actually put some thought into where I placed it Almost, not quite, but almost. So now we're just heading on down, switching back, of course, to our liquid fuel and oxidizer engines to make sure that we don't cook everyone in the base alive. I don't think they would particularly appreciate that, and it might affect their productivity uh, in actually <laughs> producing all of that vital helium-3 and deuterium, which we're going to need to fuel this craft. I'm thinking that in next generation... Um, Interstellar Craft, we might actually use antimatter power, but that's something for a very, very future episode, as that resource is even harder to obtain than Helium-3. But anyway, we will be completing the construction of the Clark and begin fueling it in the next episode. Thank you very much for watching, everyone. I do hope you've enjoyed. I'm the Video Penguin, and I will see you all next time.